as I often point out, as well as my Patreon, which obviously supplies the questions and support that allows this episode to exist, you can buy a delicious portion of GameStop, save yourself 10% off with the code THORIN, T-H-O-R-A-N, at GameStop.gg, and also support my channel and my content. And did you know, GameStop has tea now? So they actually have four different types. They have a black tea, a classic. They have a yerba mate. Those are just normal teas. You have them in the morning or wherever you want throughout the day. Then they've got two teas that are good for going to sleep. They've got ginger turmeric, which are obviously good things to have in your diet anyway for your immune system. And then they've also got sleepy time with L-theanine. And both of these, as it says on the pack, caffeine-free. So if you have a normal game subs or a tea earlier in the day and then you want to wind down, these are the way to go. And as they point out with the L-theanine one, the reason it's about L-theanine is a lot of the sleepy time teas actually will tend to have stuff like melatonin, in which personally I don't like to mess around with. So L-theanine, I think a far superior supplement to have in terms of encouraging sleep, but without the downsides, I think of mass melatonin use. So if you want to support me and save 10%, use the code THORIN at gamesups.gg. Now you might ask, tea? Why drink tea? Well, let me just give you a quote from the legendary, I would say, soldier and novelist Ernst Younger. And he said, tea is, in my opinion, a fantasticum, coffee an energicum. Tea, therefore, possesses a disproportionately higher artistic rank. I notice that coffee disrupts the delicate lattice of light and shadows, the fruitful doubts that emerge during the writing of a sentence. With tea, on the other hand, the thoughts climb genuinely upward. Just some food for thought there. Check out my offer if you'd like. Now, obviously for these AMAs, just a quick note, anyone who hasn't heard a past one, if you've ever been someone who subscribed to the $10 or above tier on my Patreon for my side channel, feel free to send me a message with a question for a future one of these, even if you no longer subscribe. As long as you don't go crazy, if you just didn't get a month before or you didn't exercise that perk, just hit me up now, you can still do it. And of course, like I often point out, if people particularly like some of these, there'll be the option to get a longer video at some point. Okay, let's jump into this. I wait a while to gather enough questions. I'd like to do more often. Some people ask questions more often. There will be more of these. Henoda, you have hinted at how the discussion for the GOAT, greatest of all time, in football, obviously we're talking about European soccer here, in football is really shallow. Consensus now seemingly being Messi, who played most of his career in weaker leagues. This is his opinion, not mine. What are some names you'd throw in the discussion that are not usually mentioned? Okay, so... First of all, it is weird that it does seem like the consensus is Messi because the bizarre thing to me is to have seen Messi play, you have to have seen Ronaldo play. And for me, if you watch Messi, you go, he's light years ahead of Ronaldo. Ronaldo's not even close. And I don't even think we're watching the same sport. As far as I'm concerned, you aren't even just a fan of Messi or greatness. You're just a fan of Messi as a character or a human. And you're like a K-pop stan. You're like a K-pop stan telling me your favorite K-pop idol is the best singer ever because you like them the most. Or you think they're the prettiest or you like their personality. What's bizarre to me is I've never had a problem saying Messi could be a GOAT contender or he might be the best player to ever play football. What's bizarre is for some reason they can't do that about Ronaldo. In fact, you'll notice what they always do is they'll even go, he's not even the best Ronaldo. <laughs> what about R9? What, you mean the guy who was like injured a bunch of his career, then got fat, then didn't train much, and then didn't do half the shit that Ronaldo number seven did? Well, at that point in time, you just obviously hate Ronaldo and you're not going to give any fucking credence whatsoever to his career, so go fuck yourself, right? Similarly, same as all the fucking Brady stands, all the Messi fans, I noticed, did the same thing. You spent the first 10 years giving one set of criteria because it favoured your guy. Then when those criteria no longer favoured your guy, you quickly pivoted to the other ones, didn't you? And then went, oh, actually, the other criteria that I didn't say count. UCLs, who the hell counts those? Say the people who, when they thought you had the lock on UCLs and goals, etc., that it had to be the thing that decided it. So I'm just bored of people like that. I can tell when someone's actually a real fan of the sport. People don't know when me and Richard's Wrath have talked about this in the past. He does think Tom Brady's the GOAT, but he'll also allow people like Deion Sanders, um, Lawrence Taylor, Jerry Rice to be in the conversation. So anyway, to bring it all the way back, basically, I would say the main problem goes like this. I think you should only do these conversations, think about it, 
based on who you saw. Like, really, it's who do you think is the GOAT? Well, it can only then go off who you saw play the game. So even though if I became a historian of football and studied all the football, got all the tips, maybe eventually I might feel like I could weigh in on how good Platini was or Pelle. I didn't watch them play, so I think it's stupid to even put them in the convo. Why not just say, I was born in this year, I've watched football from this from another year, and here's where my time period. And so in that time period, here is the best player I saw. No, no, everyone now who's even 18 or 28 has to pretend they saw people from 1960. Or just look up and go, hey, they didn't get paid much then, therefore I'll just discount all that. How about don't discount anything? Just talk about what you fucking saw, you idiots. And if you're unlucky, because in actually the esports games I follow, I was there from day one. Or in Brood War, I went back and watched all the games and tried to learn the context. Then you can actually do it. So first of all, I think some of the names that should be on this list is just that the problem is you didn't see them or I didn't see them. Have to be Pele, obviously, but I didn't fucking see him. I saw some YouTube clips and some documentary stuff. Platini, he looks like he was fucking unbelievable, doesn't he? But it wasn't my era. Cruyff, for obvious reasons. Oh, absolutely fucking insane the impact he had on football but again it wasn't my year I didn't watch him play I don't know how good the opposition is and then Maradona is the obvious one as well like I saw some of the end of Maradona and I used to watch Serie A in the early 90s so I have a sense but even then that when he was when he wasn't as good and then a lot of the other stuff some international play and the leagues it wasn't as popular to move around the world back then so it's really hard to gauge these I think you should mainly just leave those out by the way I might joke on Twitter but I, I saw more of Messi than I saw of Maradona so of course I put Messi over Maradona but I'll tell you what if you're going to be a little shit and say that Ronaldo number 7 isn't the best Ronaldo well then fuck you Messi isn't even the best Argentinian player and if you know what, if you want to talk about just scoring pure goals, maybe fucking Batistuta was better as well. There we go. Enjoy that one, dickheads. Two can play that game. So, okay, how about this? I feel like at the moment, in line with your question, that there's actually only four names people realistically think is the greatest of all time. If we're talking about all people and all the experts and all that jazz. It's these four names. It's Pele, Maradona, Messi, and then Ronaldo being Cristiano Ronaldo. I'd say some people, especially those that obviously were his teammates or played against him in the 90s, say Ronaldo number nine because their whole point is at his peak, he was insane. When he was at Barcelona, he was insane. The early inter period, the 98 World Cup, well, until the finals, obviously. That period, yeah, he was bomb because the problem is his, his peak's so short, isn't it? I saw this player play the whole time. Some of y'all are really forgetting that last 10 years. I can tell you, like the joke is on those teams, what is it? The dance fault they're not winning the fucking UCL every year, is it? Fuck. He won without him. It's fucking people like Ronaldo. What should you tell me the best? Where are all their like hat tricks in the big finals and these massive things winning them all the cops? Because I'll tell you what, CR7, best player I've ever seen in any fucking sport are delivering in the big game of winning. Hence why those aforementioned Messi fans had to quickly shift which particular team uh, accomplishments make you the goat. No, it's not what they've done is make it your country. Well, spoiler, in history, who's better? Portugal, aren't you fucking rats? And in this era, are you fucking kidding me? So I think people make it those four or those five. But I think there's three people that have a strong case that I have to put in based on seeing them myself and following the leagues they played in. And those are going to be two players who mainly played in Serie A when they were at their peak and one who played in the English Premier League. Oh my God! Oh, are you ready? So I'm going to go with Zidane. It's the reason why I made that comment about Fallen. I actually think Zidane's mad underrated at this point in time because people only go off fucking goals. I don't get it, mate. Like, you are aware if you have someone like Zidane, you don't need your goal strikers to be as good, by the way, the goal scorers. You can even argue maybe your defence doesn't have to be as good. Has there ever been a better player at just controlling a game, being in control of the ball, passing the ball, receiving the ball? By the way, he can when he needs to, Steven Gerrard style, just score an unbelievable goal like that fucking Bayer Leverkusen one or the World Cup final in that year. But he can also just be the guy who just pings the ball all day long, who just never loses the ball, who just always takes the ball from his half to the other half, goes around people, creates a play, creates a mismatch. Oh, this guy was so... So fucking good. It's mental. And he did it in both La Liga and Serie A. By the way, basically the polar opposite style of league. There's a reason why certain people didn't work in Serie A or couldn't be as good in La Liga. This guy could, would just be good everywhere. It's like that quote Alex Ferguson has about fucking Ronaldo. This guy'd be good playing for Stoke in a random FA Cup game. He doesn't need the team built around him. He is the team. So I think Zidane's got to be up there. Why are you not allowed to be up there as a midfielder? I'll never understand. It's the same thing as how no defensive player can be the goat of the fucking 
the NFL. Meanwhile, you've seen the impact the defense has from people like Reggie White, Lawrence Taylor, fucking Ray Lewis. They were monsters. They really could win the game, even though they can't score as much. Obviously, you can score in that sport, but obviously, primarily, you'd have stopped the other person scoring. And so, I've got two players, by the way. Neither of these are attacking players. And the other one's, oh, how can I do it? Because I actually fucking watch the sport, you idiots. Football, by the way, is a brilliant sport for this. Is actually, you can be an awesome defensive team and win one nil or on penalties just by shutting them down completely never giving them a chance and then being very efficient with your chances or counter-attacking as by the way Jose Mourinho Jose Mourinho teams proved fucking Italy for like the last 50 years or whatever it might be the really great teams in Italy as well except didn't have all the fucking Dutch players banging in 20 goals they were all gods of defence weren't they you park the bus after you go 1-0 up or in a game which is they've got way better uh, offence you just park it from the beginning and win in extra time or fucking penalties so I think immediately if you don't think Maldini can be in this conversation, I don't know what we're doing at this point in time. Like, the joke is, Maldini transcends defence. Like, he clearly has the skill set. He probably actually, in a, in a different world, maybe he should be like a midfielder or something, like a holding midfielder. This guy was too good. There's a reason why this guy is with, like, the best defenders at the end of the 80s, the best defenders in the 90s, the best defenders in the 2000s. And the joke is, he's one of those people that just look like he could have kept going forever. Like, even when he was, at the beginning, it was athleticism. And then he had a great mind for the game because he played with the Brazies. Then he became, like, a great captain figure in the intangibles. And at the end of the game, he just was mega efficient and just never needed to have that extra bit of pace or use athleticism. He was just a master of the game. So, to me, there's a reason this guy was the crown jewel of some of the best Champions League, European Cup, and defensive teams to ever play football. Like, how can this guy not be considered up there? There's a reason why his teams did that, no matter who you're changing on the attacking end of the field. And then the last one, people are going to hate this. I don't give a fuck. I saw him play. It's got to be Peter Schmeichel, the goalkeeper of Manchester United during, I would say, their best period. They used to have players coming and going every two or three years in that team. And you know what? Some of them were better. Some of them weren't that good. There's some that were busts in the 90s. People forget. But I'll tell you what, this guy was just like the best at his position every year almost. Maybe, maybe there's the audio where like David Seaman or something could have contended with him. He was just the best at his position for like a solid decade at least. He was fucking unbelievable. And then you see what he did with Denmark. Denmark has no business ever contending for any title in a European competition or doing anything at a World Cup. This this guy was the reason they had chances because he really is a fucking brick wall who gives you a mega chance to have a clean sheet or in a game where you should get thrashed 3-0 he'll just let in one goal I fucking love this guy. He's one of them. It's funny because I hated Man U and Man U fans. But one of the reasons towards the end that I hated them is they kept talking when this guy was gone. Like they're just odd goalkeepers. And then some of them, they got fucking Van der Sar on his second leg. One of the all time great goalkeepers as well. Oh, and then they just had David De Gea, who's pretty good. Like they, and then, oh, they thought, by the way, De Gea and Bartes were shit. That's what Man U fans are like. The most spoiled fan base of fucking all time. So yeah, I think this guy was unbelievable. Oh, yeah. And did I mention he's also fucking bonkers at penalties too? And look at the size of him. He was basically built to be a fucking god goalkeeper, wasn't he? Now look, Buffon didn't do anything wrong in his whole career almost. Oliver Kahn was inhuman. But this this is the guy, I'm sorry, if I had like gun to my head, this is the person I'm picking. These would all be in my like all 11. Absolutely. And then, look, the problem with the other people is either people like Ronaldo or Messi partly because of the era they play with all the sports science and the sports technology. Their longevity is just too insane, as well as their peak being bonkers. But if we're going off just peak and your absolute best years, and so we're talking about the idea of who's the greatest football of all time, like for one game or one year or a three-year span, I think there's some names you have to chuck in there. And again, they're going to hurt some feelings. So I'll start with the ones I think are less controversial. I think Marco Van Basten has to be there. He's one of the main reasons I even watched football. That's why when they had Italian football on free TV in the UK, I used to watch AC Milan every fucking week. I love that shit. And until this guy got those injuries, I'm telling you, he was going to be like a GOAT contender. He was just like a guaranteed goal in a big game. His skill level was unbelievable. Even in Serie A, where they're all marking you like a motherfucker, he was just wrecking people. He was just unstoppable. The joke is only fucking injury could stop this guy. He was that good. Then, by the way, there's another Dutchie I'm going to throw in there. How about fucking Rude Hullet? I can tell if you watched football in the 80s or the early 90s, if you actually know how good fucking Rude Hullet was. Isn't this just like one of the best midfielders, attacking midfielders to ever play any fucking form of sport, especially football? Like, just a bonkers play. Again, mixture of control, technique, 
effortless, scores round people, fucking big as well, got physical presence, scores goals, does it everywhere he goes, Netherlands, fucking English Premier League, Serie A, by the way, it does it even in Sampdoria in Serie A, and like not even the best team, this guy was getting them to win like the fucking cup or whatever it is in Italy, he won the European cup, Ballon d'Or winner, oh, this guy was too good, like the joke is, the story goes that the reason why he was a dickhead as a manager is he just couldn't comprehend people weren't as good as him, he's just too fucking good at the game, now look, it wasn't for like 20 years like some of the guys were talking about, but I'll tell you what, this guy at his peak was fucking unbelievable, he was really, really special, and then the last one is going to hurt a lot of feelings, but it's what I saw. I know internationally, those England teams were a nightmare. So you're never going to let anyone who was in those 90s and early 2000s England's team be the best, right? Because we all know, like, they had too many weird, like, disputes and never got on the same page and there was no synergy. And so it made everyone look worse who played for those teams. Well, I'll tell you what. If you just saw a domestic play, and yes, obviously he didn't get many chances at European Cups because his team wasn't in position. I don't care what you think. Alan Shearer is one of the best players I have ever seen play any sport ever. Again, just guaranteed goals. He's too strong. Yeah, listen, he had certain parts of the pitch he tried to score from. He had certain like types of angles he'd take, but he just made it work. Like, the joke is, him and penalties is the best example. So one of the best penalty takers ever, because he just blasts it into the top corner every time as hard as possible, which is impossible to save. And he could just do that routinely. He's a really, really insane player. Like, if you love strikers, look, there's people I think are better than him at football, but I don't think there's many people have played the position of striker better than this guy did. Now, true, it's hard to make him the GOAT because, unlike a lot of the names on here, he didn't get 10 cracks at a Champions League or he wasn't in a position to win the World Cup. You know, that's that's a tough, that's a problem when some of the others can and were and did do. It's like I always say about the Brady one in... Uh, the NFL, like, one thing I'll never say about Brady, even if I think some of his teams were better and he had a lot of help, he still did do the things he did. You still cannot deny that. You can't just hate on him like the fucking Messi fan does Ronaldo. You've got to give him his credit. And by the way, early, like, if we're talking like 2006 to maybe 2014, he was also just a beast individually. And he did fucking throw an awesome looking spiral and he could do the short pass and he could do the deep ball. Yeah, listen, the career before was carried by the defense and the career afterwards was amazing defenses and not having to do that much and doing short checkdowns, etc. He does a checkdown when a Josh Allen would throw for the end zone. But I'll tell you what, he was fucking insane in those years. So now when it comes to this topic, look, I do think the league you play in matters. Now, I don't think La Liga is bad, but I think it clearly fucking mega inflates the goals you score, doesn't it? Like, how many people who in the Premier League struggled, in Serie A struggled, go to the La Liga and can bag in 25 or 30 goals a season all of a sudden? Give me a fucking break. Like, people like Forlan look like they couldn't play football in the Premier League, and then they look like they're the best when they're in La Liga. So, like, fucking Bergkamp couldn't get it done in Serie A, people don't know. But even people like Ronaldo had quieter seasons. Yes, they had injuries as well. But the difference is in La Liga, they were just scoring for fun every game. So I don't have a problem if you only played most of your career like Messi did in the fucking La Liga, at least the years that matter. Because the difference is even Ronaldo's fucking output went up when he went to La Liga. And even Ronaldo's went down proportionately when he went to Serie A. So the league you play in is more important than the number of goals because you have to put it into context, don't you? Like in La Liga, you pump up the goals. In Serie A, the defense gets insane. In the EP, you have to have physicality and especially in the days when they used to ref a lot fucking looser when you're in that league you get kicked a lot in the way that you wouldn't be allowed to be in Italy then you've got to ask what teammates did they have did they even have a team that was good enough like the idea that Harry Kane suddenly is insane and one of the best players ever when he's playing in Bayern Munich but what the hell in Spurs he can't win a trophy he's the same fucking player you idiot then how about like Van Dijk oh everyone knows this guy should win the Ballon d'Or best football I have ever seen at defence no one said any of that shit when he's at Southampton why could you see it where was your eye test and then also how about what manager you had like I don't think it's a coincidence that Ronaldo and Messi had checks notes the greatest managers to ever play football or coaching football probably now someone could spin it and go maybe they are because they had them no that doesn't make sense look at look at fucking Pep's career without Messi look at Alex Ferguson without Ronaldo look at Mourinho without Ronaldo doesn't really yield up, does it? If anything, it helps to have the best coaches as well to be the best players. So, yeah, those are the players I would throw just in the conversation. If I actually had to pick, my personal pick is CR7, Ronaldo. After that, the problem is I didn't see enough of Maradona, even though I do think everything I saw of him makes him seem impossible. He actually is very similar to Messi. If people don't know the skill set he has. Um, Messi's right up there. There's days I can go Messi too. I also think Zidane, Maldini, 
And then the problem with the Schmeichel one is that's more like I still need to have obviously good strikers. The real reason for me why Ronaldo, number seven, is the best player of all time is because I think he's the only player that is a cheat code. Like Messi might be the best dribbler. It's up there with Maradona, by the way. He might be the best dribbler ever. He's really good at scoring, assisting. But here's the difference. To win football games, the most important thing, bar none, is to score goals. And nobody's better at scoring all types of goals than Ronaldo consistently in every league at the top level and in the biggest games like the Champions League. So yeah, that's about, by the way, I'll even throw this out there. If everyone wants to say, I don't count, by the way, when they play in MLS or fucking the Saudi leagues, but I will just say this. If the Saudi leagues are mega shit, then why don't people like Neymar and Mane and all those guys, why don't they just bag in 50 goals too? Why don't, why don't they just put it in? If, if it's that easy, if it's just all garbage, why don't all these players just run circles around everyone? Hmm. Certainly makes you wonder, doesn't it? Now, Pacey says, what was the event or piece of material that made you rethink what you were programmed to believe? Well, the problem with that is that the video would have to be like four hours long. By the way, that even might be a cool idea. Maybe I'll do a video of a bunch of things through my life that were like pivotal moments or things I encountered that transformed my thinking. But I'll give you a few. The obvious one is books. Like, what's cool is, I got into Robert Ander Wilson through the Illuminatus trilogy, which is a fiction series. But even that is sort of mind-blowing in the questions it asks and the theories it suggests. And especially because some of them were very silly theories back then that now not only have way more to them, but some of them, quite frankly, some of them wouldn't just sell how crazy the world in reality seemed to be. Similarly, once I got into him, then I went and bought Cosmic Trigger. I actually naively and richly, because of the title, thought it was a similar book, a fiction book. Turned out to be a sort of biography. It's a banger of a guy who has all these connections to all people in, who were counter-cultural figures and radicals in the 60s and then he's meeting and going through all this stuff he's doing experiments on himself and his own consciousness now I will say like Christopher Hitchens it led me to a lot of maybe what I would consider now wrong conclusions or principles that I wouldn't want to live my life by but they were transformative at the time for good or for ill similarly Prometheus Rising think about all the fucking different exercises in there and how they'll shape your perception or change and challenge certain ideas about the world in reality an obvious one I always reference it because it was massively influential as I'd say in the last 10 years a massive one especially politically was Ayn Rand like if you go and read The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged I think she nails something poignant about the way people are the way society is the what people expect of others like what they think they're entitled to how they would use you if they had political financial or physical control over you and what kinds of freedoms they do think exist and who should do what and I think there's a lot in there to be said about the West that asks certain ideas about socialism or communism or the people and the good of the many outweigh the mood of the few. There's a lot going on there. And then I'll have to throw in because he was so influential on me, Christopher Hitchens. Like, even though, again, I would say the cool thing about him was he exposed me to authors I hadn't thought of or angles I hadn't thought of or arguments I hadn't heard of or things about history that I would have had total totally different perception about. Then I'll just throw in a couple more obvious ones. How about a certain medical event a few years ago? Don't know about you, that changed my thinking forever. That's not something I just put back in the box where people are like, the genie's back in the bottle. It's just back to the world of 2019. We never went back to 2019. We never will, by the way. Like, the world changed forever after that. That opened my eyes to a lot of things. I wasn't even cynical enough about certain things in the world. And then I'll also say... Nowadays, because I've sort of got the filters set this way and I've opened up and removed a lot of my inhibitions, I would actually say every, almost everything makes me rethink things or consider things or ask questions or I look at things that otherwise might have been silly or dismissed and now I give them a bit of thought or I ask myself, oh, maybe don't judge that too soon or maybe look into something more with that or, okay, that's not for me now, but hey, let that go for now. Maybe I come back to that later or I'll re-encounter it later when something else has changed in me and now suddenly it's really interesting. I'd say I'm less judgmental in some ways, even though in terms of what I like know I'm into or interested in, I think's right, I'm more discerning if you see the difference there. Rock says, considering Djokovic just broke the last significant record, what do you think about the big three debate now? I'm a Novak supporter, but I do think there are still arguments to be made for the other two. This goes in line with the overemphasis on stats in modern sports. Okay, well, I'll just throw this out there. When you say broke the last significant record, you're sort of doing what Nadal fans do there. You're just deciding that any records he doesn't own or is nowhere close to don't exist or don't matter. So here's an obvious question for you. How many gold medals at the Olympics does Novak Djokovic have? Just a question. Just thought I'd ask that question. Here's the thing, by the way. I'm not saying he can't be the GOAT, but just don't frame it in a silly way as well. Just be honest on that one, you know. So, okay, assuming you're talking about Grand Slams and weeks at number one and World Tour fight. Yeah, all the things that Federer had. Okay, that's cool. Then it says, 
Oh, yeah, so the other way of stats, so you don't want it to be about stats. Good, because I tell you what, I'm not about stats. So my problem is this. First and foremost, what are we even talking about when you say the GOAT? Are we meaning for one game, the player at his best was the best, or do we mean every moment in their career aggregated who overall was the best? I think we're asking different questions there. I sometimes think it goes between the two, but I also don't blame people who just pick a peak and they think that player would essentially beat everyone if everyone was the same age as them in the same setting. So that's a different type of GOAT. So also you've got to define that. So the first thing I would say is the problem with the tennis debate goes like this. Two things. One, I do think people are using this thing now like they do with the wallet well, okay what more does he have to do what what thing that when he does you'll then say he was the best I, I don't know what you're asking at that point in time because we're talking about who's the best player ever by the way if someone's like let's say i think someone's an eight out of ten player but then he went on to win the most grand slams do i now have to make him a ten out of ten player ignore what my eyes and brain said and say he, he would beat everyone even though the players he might be competing with in a goat conversation might never have played him or in his era I mean, what am I doing at that point in time? Does the absolute number just make him the best, overwriting what I saw? To me, the reason why most GOAT debates are a waste of time is it's not really about just your resume, is it? How you play and what you were able to do when you played and the context of your games and how difficult... All these things matter, right? So at the end of the day, if I think Kobe is better than LeBron, it probably doesn't matter what LeBron does. I mean, I'm judging off LeBron's 20-year career. I wasn't going off just when the first time I saw him. So it doesn't matter if he adds a bunch more rings. It won't make him, as a player, better than Kobe in my mind. So similarly, I don't think Djokovic essentially can probably do anything to make himself the GOAT if I think Federer is the GOAT. And then it doesn't help that some of the resume things are pretty close, right? So the big problem is this. Let's start at the top. I'll probably do a video on this, by the way, who the tennis courts. I could do a whole thing, but I'll do a shorter version here. First and foremost, the problem is tech. Now, there's an obvious thing I'm going to say at the outset, and it goes like this, right? You have to consider that everyone passed about, I'm going to say like, 2003, had access to way better sports psychs, way better sports science, way better racket technology. The courts changed and became slower and more homogenous instead of more distinct and extremely defined. Even things like shoes got better. So as a result, and then they got like their fucking Hawkeye instead of just some fucking guy, well, I think I saw it in, like none of that shit, right? So with all these factors... I think these are some of the factors that have allowed the great players of this era, the last 20 to 30 years, to be the best. And I'll just say this 25 years. And here's the problem I have. When it was just Federer, okay, maybe he's just the GOAT. Then it was him and Nadal. Fuck, we're so lucky to get two of the greatest players of all time at the same time. Fucking hell, the Djokovic guy can do it as well. They're all winning 20 Grand Sums. Oh, and then the Murray guy doesn't win the Grand Sums because they win them off him. But he's just insanely consistent. They can be in like look every semi-final, can be in a billion finals, can be in a million ATP, can win. Guys, what are the chances that the three best players of all time just played in exactly the same era with all these different, uh, massively different intangibles and tangible factors that I listed that are different from other eras. Oh, and then there's a fourth guy who was fucking super consistent as well. So essentially, they all have just the best consistency ever, except maybe like, what, Ivan Lendl from the fucking 80s. Except for that, and Bjorn Borg when he's in his prime. No one else has, the, and just four of them at the same exact time. Give me a break. That suggests that they have a massive advantage, that some of their stats are inflated, guys. Like, spoiler, if all of the surfaces were the same way and with the same tech, then first of all, some people, like maybe Sampras never wins any Grand Slams with that style to serve and volley. Then again, maybe Andre Agassi wins twice as many because he's mega from the base. You know what I mean? Like this, it changes the whole game, but we're acting like they all played in all of history on the same core, the same thing. that They didn't. This is actually one of the sports where tech has had the biggest influence. So then let's get into it. I don't think titles even make sense as an absolute because they only ever make sense in context. They're not a good cheat code to figure out who's better. Like, for example, a lot of people who were not Nadal and Djokovic fans said that Federer's early dominance before they were old enough or even in the scene doesn't count because like, he was just playing lesser players. Like, first of all, they don't know those players, but okay. Well, here's the problem. Then why do all these ones for Nadal and Djokovic in these last few years count when Federer was busted slash retired and Murray was gone with his injury? Why does it count when they win against people who aren't ready or even capable of closing games and winning? Like, you watch people like Sinner now. Look, Alcaraz is the shit, but... Oh, I even fucking quite like the Russian guy. But if you watch people like Sinner, these are the best players who were supposed to be stopping these guys winning trophies. You do know Federer was playing against like other champions like Roddick, like Hewitt, like Nalbandian, etc. Like these were fucking monster, like fucking Safin. These guys were killers. 
Killers. The joke is, it's people like Federer stop them having the titles. Like, even if Djokovic wasn't here, some of these fuckers would just have two or three each. That's it. Ever. So I actually think this year is mad week, but everyone's cool with fucking Djokovic and Naval stacking Grand Slam still, right? Weird how that works. Then that whole court surface, speed, what the frequency of the courts are on the tour, we're going to act like that's not a factor. By the way, it helps Nadal that we have this massive clear circuit with all these events, so he can get these crazy records. There isn't that many big events for fucking grass, which is the best one for Federer. And by the way, every court, except maybe Wimbledon, but even then it's way closer than the 90s. Every court's just slow now. The joke is the hard courts play, not totally like the clay court, but it's not a million miles from it. And the Australian Open and the US Open may as well be the same court. It's just a different fucking temperature and people cheering for you, different Anglos cheering for you, right? So to me, the real question is, it's about peak and best level and skills. That's what's going to determine who the greatest is to you. So I will say this. I think that does play very well in the favour of Federer and Djokovic. And by the way, people like Sampras. Over the likes of Nadal, Agassi, etc. Maybe even Lendl. Although I actually didn't watch enough of his career to really make a statement on that one. So for me... Nadal never was and never will be the GOAT. Just never been the one that I vibed with in that way. I thought that it was there. I don't care how many Grand Slams he wins. I don't care how many clay court tournaments he wins. It's not why I'm judging it off. I'd even take Sampras over him if you know contextually what they were doing. Sampras was a fucking killer. He really was a Michael Jordan-esque figure. Now, you think about things like racket, surface, style, strength. Sampras absolutely could be better than Nadal. Now, here's the thing I think. I still think Federer is the greatest player of all time. And I've thought that since he had about six Grand Slams or something. First of all, my eye test just tells me he's the best player I've ever seen play tennis. Then let's just face it. The real problem you have with Federer is you think because of Nadal and Djokovic playing in the same era that you can compare them. But how can you? They can't all just play when they're all 28 at the peak of their physical prime, right? So we can never really know directly head-to-head -head in that sense just how good they are. Like, you actually saw that 2017 sort of, like, renaissance year for Federer. What would have happened if someone like a Djokovic wasn't really around and Murray wasn't really around and Nadal's... Suddenly, he just wins everything again, even when he's mega old. In theory, he shouldn't be winning anything at this point in time. Some of these guys, without the others, would have just farmed the whole circuit as well. Now, the thing about Nadal is, I will always incredibly admire his heart. His heart is fucking unbelievable. I actually think his heart's even better than Djokovic. I think Djokovic might have a better mental fortune, but the heart and belief that Nadal has is... I've never seen him actually sort of beaten spiritually, as it were. I've seen him lose games. I've never seen him beaten in that particular... It reminds me of Virtus Pro and Couch Strike. People know the analogy. Yeah, but the problem is, that's why so many of his epic wins outside of clay court are just close wins or impossible comebacks or he wins through grit. The difference is, Federer can just blow you off the court. Djokovic can blow you off the court or win a really close... He can do it all, basically. So the thing with Djokovic is this. I actually think the most insane thing about Djokovic is you either can go with, like, 2011 peak when his physicality was insane. You can go to, like, a 2015 when he was still bonkers and he was right in the middle but actually the most impressive thing for me about Djokovic is this last few years it's this sort of Michael Jordan on the second three-peat era where he's supposed to be a bit too old and it's actually time people use your name to boost their career and take some of the scalps that you're delivering by still playing but you just keep winning anyway and saying nah not yet. I'm just going to keep winning all these. You've just mastered the game. I think it's actually insane, the guy's consistency. Yes, he doesn't have those same big rivals stopping him each time or battling him each time. But when they're not there, he just runs the fucking game, doesn't he? That's why it will be cool if Alcaraz keeps going and gets even better and better and better. Because we'll actually get to see like the last years of Djokovic, but tested to the absolute limit. So in some ways, the longevity of Djokovic is his most impressive quality to me. I actually think a lot of the longevity of Nadal is, let's be real, it's just the fucking French Open in it. Then I'll just throw this out there. I'll give you the MNA analogy so you can see it. So I think Federer would be like Anderson Silva. At his peak, he's just the scariest. He can beat anyone. Djokovic is more like GSP. It's a little bit more boring, but he is just fantastic. He's still better than most people whenever you see him play. He can win in all particular ways. He's a technician and a, and a tactician. And then I would say Nadal, no disrespect, but he's more like Frankie Edgar, or if you want to go with an old school name, how about Minotauro Noguera? These are just people who have crazy heart. They're also really skilled. They're contenders to be the best and to win championships, and they've been champions. But it is their insane heart, their never-say-die attitude. These sound like cliches for other people. They aren't with these guys. They're fucking unbelievable in that sense. So when it goes like, what more does he have to do to be the greatest? It's not a fucking Pokemon quest, is it? It's just on you to decide. And if you think I'm biased, well, yeah, of course I am. I'm extremely biased to my opinion. That's the point of having an opinion. Spoonfed89. In terms of creative work, would you say 
that placing artificial restrictions on yourself, e.g. Jack White playing a damaged guitar to challenge himself, or allowing for endless experimentation is better for you. Right, the thing about this is, I would say in general, you need both, and to master both is what will make you a really well-rounded, um, incredibly productive figure. Because I think restrictions can be a cheat code, especially early on, to force a type of focus, to force innovation, to force just looking at what you do have and what you can make out of it. I think that's really useful. But I think as you develop, and especially once you learn how to motivate yourself internally and how to make yourself work and you learn techniques, etc., and you learn how to expand out your skill set and your imagination, I think eventually you want to be able to to either intentionally force limitations that you don't have to have or just master your energy and flow and be able to work in a totally un uncompromising way. I like both. I mean, my analogy would be this. There's some people out there might grumble about bosses and having to get up early in the morning, but would they really actually do as much work if they were sat at home and it was work from home and they could set their own hours? I think a lot of them would be too nice to themselves just give themselves time off. I don't think they'd work themselves harder. They wouldn't be more efficient. They actually get more done when they're sort of just forced to and they're just stuck in an office so they can't go and read it and they have to do a bit of work or they know they've got to have something put in by 2 p.m. There's a type of that. So my issue is this. I sort of think I like both. Like, I sometimes like to set myself a date to do something by a deadline or a certain task or a target that I'm not sure I can do to force myself to find a way to do it. But then I also like to just be totally freestyle and do whatever comes of mind or whatever it might be, easy, hard, simple, and just do that and have the joy of creation and see what comes of it. So I would say the freestyle approach is very good for generating ideas. I think the restrictions is sometimes good for just getting it done and into the real world and downloaded and done by a certain date and in a certain manner however scoffed that might be so i think both are good in different ways you need both and they actually can synergize believe it or not santiago lafaga says recently i've heard you talk about the concept that whenever someone is in a situation even when many would consider that is someone else's fault they also had a role to play in creating said situation for themselves as a big believer in this philosophy i wanted to get more of your thoughts about it i would describe it as ultimate responsibility all interactions are co-created which means they retire require the participation of all parties involved the saying goes it takes two to tango and as time passes i agree with that sentiment more and more if not in a physical human sense at least in a spiritual sense this ties into the idea that humans have souls which come to earth with a purpose and sign up for certain experiences to me all of this also means that we are ultimately empowered to create a reality that serves us well, since reality is partly our creation and requires our participation. To what extent do you agree with the, these ideas? To whatever extent you agree, how would you live out these principles in practice? Right, what I would say is this. One of the main reasons, even just psychologically, this is a great technique to use, is because you can only control yourself by and large and most of the time. So if you always consider that part of it isn't your fault, but it can be your responsibility, then you will look for the part where you could change things, make things better, fix things. And I think that's a very, very positive thing. I think instead, if you always just look to blame and who is the most to blame and it's not my fault, you will always just externalize it. And in fact, sometimes you will intentionally withdraw because it's not my fault. Whereas if you actually care about the thing, the person or wanting to get something solved, this oftentimes forces you to be involved, to do something. So I think it's better to force solutions from your end sometimes than just whine to other people or complain. I also think, by the way, if you look at this approach, because it's not your fault, it will actually encourage a type of thinking I have found very useful in my personal and professional life, which goes, learn to look down the line and see a problem coming that isn't a problem yet or is a very small problem and get ahead of it. Pass it, cut it off at the pass. Do something which limits or neutralizes the effect it's going to have. Actually, just have an intervention or a moment where you force things to not happen sometimes that way. That's way easier, in my opinion, to avoid the problem occurring than to try and solve it afterwards, fix it afterwards, or work with someone whose fault it actually is that it happened. There's a massive aspect of the leadership. Don't put your people in bad positions. Don't let them get into bad positions instead of just then telling them what they should do or scolding them when they do. The problem you're going to have is this. One, when some people hear it's your responsibility, even if it isn't your fault, they don't listen to the fault part or know the distinction. So they go, right, so everything's my fault. So everything that happens is... Down. Well, the problem is if you believe that, you'll have a very horrible life. And people who are like that tend to have very shitty lives and torture themselves. And so in some sense, I think that's a kind of hell, isn't it? The kind of person who just really does blame themselves for everything and feels like they're a worthless piece of shit, puts themselves down, won't let themselves have anything nice or do anything nice or be with anything. Isn't that hell? 
Like, could you even imagine something worse than that? It sounds like the worst existence possible. So I would just say the distinction is the key, as usual. Context is everything, right? The problem a lot of people have is this. They only see their point of view. So unless they force reflection or some sort of technique or way of getting out of their head and seeing it from a bigger picture or a side position, it's easy to just go, I forgive myself for anything I did because I know why I did it, what I was thinking, what I was feeling, what I would have liked to have done, what the opposite. But you don't give the other people the same credence. So as a result, it's obvious they made a stupid mistake. It's not my fault. So why should I do anything? Whereas I wouldn't have done it differently. And if I did make a mistake, well, I had my reasons why. And there's extenuating circumstances and I'll do it better next time. Exactly. So there's another thing. People don't judge themselves to the same standard. I think this is also great in the sense that in the same way you forgive yourself, learn to forgive others. In the same way as you might be hard to yourself, be hard to others, but try and find out the context of why it's hard for them or why they're not able to live up to it or what's going on there. That's the problem. So in my opinion, if you know that, then you have to consider what's going on from the other person's POV or a third person point of view. And that might give you a very different sense of what's going on in this situation. Then I actually do kind of vibe with what you're saying. I do kind of think this life in some way feels like some sort of a school course that I signed up to or a training level to learn something. There does seem to be that, whether it's that young quote about if you don't sort of address things within your shadow, they will essentially emerge externally as events and things and people in your life to kind of like, put the lesson to you in your face, as it were. You won't actually do it on time. So now it'll throw it right up in your face to solve it. Because I have to say, even minor things like having reply guys try to fuck with me on Twitter or people baiting me in the industry for clout or someone lying about me or attacking something or finding some new angle. Even these things can be their own blessing if you actually have sort of a grateful mindset and you use this approach. Because what it makes me think is this. Yes, the person made a stupid comment, but was there a way to avoid reading it? If I saw it, is there a way I can talk to myself and make it so I don't emotionally engage with it. Is there a way when people are baiting me, I can think of the bigger picture and where this will go if I respond in a certain way? And do I want to go down that path? Will it be back worse for me and them potentially? If people are lying about me, maybe they have other reasons to do that. And that's their problem, not mine. It says more about them than me. There's all sorts of factors in this particular way. And I do that. If you don't learn these lessons, I do find that you bang up against the wall over and over and over again. And I tell you what, I've been quite a stubborn person in my life. I have been a slow learner, even though once I get going, then I can be a very fast learner. But once I learn the lesson, I always say this, I might take a long time to learn the lesson, but once I learn it, I don't forget it. I have a great memory in that sense. So I would say one thing you can do is have modes. Like have a mode where it's like, right, if I'm in battle, if it's every day, well, I've just got to get things done. In this scenario, if you're in battle, you have to take charge, you have to accomplish certain tasks, you have to do the steps to get those tasks done, and you have to manage certain expectations to achieve certain goals. That's everyday life, and that's the battle. That's being in the thick of it. But after the battle, or before the battle, you can assess, you can plan. Like I say, you can think what could go wrong, what might go right, and might be able to help that. What are things that might change? How difficult, or how easy this is? How, if there's going to be problems, can I get someone else who helps to make that not a problem? Can I actually take responsibility away from someone who can't bear the responsibility? There's all sorts of facts. I would say that's how you think about it. It's mainly the worldview and the perspective I think is key more than specific techniques in this regard. Hamdi Asfor says, Do you like music artists that stick to their guns most of their career? Vinnie Paz, R.A. the Rugged Man. Or do you like the artists who are always trying to not make the same album again? Kanye West. Right. I'm sure people are going to know the obvious answer is both, isn't it? Like, I actually appreciate both types. One of the things that changed about me, even in esports, is I had a certain type of player I really liked, but then I learned through time to appreciate the other type of player who might be their rival in the same way as I used to be a massive Federer fan. But then over the time, I came to admire Nadal a lot as well for having differing qualities and being able to beat Federer in certain matches. So what I would say is I love people who do stay in that groove and just master it and keep doing it and don't worry about the idea it has to be something new. No, no, they can just do something awesome and excellent within the same groove and they're just the best at it. Like an obvious example, it's an extreme one, but I've often given it as someone I recommend, would be the Alias Alaska, which is an atmospheric, more sort of like, some in some ways down-tempo form of drum and bass by the artist called Paradox, who you might know does sort of drum funk style, but this is a very different style when he does Alaska. He just very much has his sort of office, as it were, that he set up and he just goes to work there and it's awesome. At the same time, I also appreciate, even if the music might not always be as good, I have a massive appreciation for people who force change or growth as a challenge. It's kind of like that last question, right, about restrictions versus just doing whatever. I think that can be very exciting. I love people with ambition and balls and I'll forgive a lot more if you feel in that sense, if you really were going for it. 
In the same way as I often say, that's why I think about some of the more flawed Terry Gilliam films. I'll take the flawed gem or an awesome Wells film over just some good film that's a seven out of 10 by Steven Spielberg, right? And so I think in the same way as I could do like Alaska for like staying in one style or I don't know, Porcupine Tree or something. If I want to go with teams, bands that change all the time, we're talking about Kanye West, yeah. He's clearly he's trying to change his style and revolutionize hip hop many times. I think Alva, the Norwegian black metal band who became every other type of genre of music, they're a great example. I don't have to like every album, but I love that they keep trying. I think it's kind of like esports. Some people overrate the refiners. Wow, he's just the greatest of all time. Some people way overrate the innovators. He invented that build. He came up with it. Was he the best at it? I think both are excellent, and I think people can combine both as well. By the way, if you want some examples, I mean, I'll give you two examples that aren't actually about music, but I'll use art here. I think two examples of where to tie in this concept to like innovation and refinement, I'm going to tie it to the concept that the other guy said earlier about restricting yourself. I think there are two films that show how restriction can actually make you better. Donnie Darko, if you've never seen the theatrical cut, there's an extended version that actually has loads of exposition about time travel and the theory of that woman and how it works. Now, the original film, he had to trim all of that. He had to be super ruthless with the story. And so loads of that isn't in it, but it makes it more mysterious. It gives it a better mystique. It doesn't tell you what's going on. It makes it just kind of cooler and more enigmatic as a film. As you, If you saw that guy afterwards with like Southland Tales, that guy became a fucking bum when he had loads of money and loads of space to do whatever he wanted. Donnie Darko, the theatrical cut, is a banger movie. That should be a cult classic. Another one, everyone knows the movie Primer is a brilliant sci-fi film. But the reason why it's so brilliant is the way he had to structure it and tell it is because he made it for like $4,000 or something mad. So he didn't have special effects. He couldn't show the time machine. He had to conceptually make you think and believe it was a time machine and then make you think of the possibilities. Again, go watch that guy when he made Upstream Colour and different films. I think they're kind of trash. Nowhere near the same level. But these guys looked brilliant. In fact, he just said... Man, take the shackles off these guys and give them a blank check to do whatever they want. Oh, wait, it's a nightmare. So I'll just say, like I said before, I like that analogy of when the boss sets the hours versus working your own hours. And I think I've also answered your music question there. Air Delosi says, Hello, Thorin. I've always had an issue distilling truth when reading news stories. To be honest, I've simply stopped consuming the news altogether but I dislike being uninformed. Have you made a video in the past detailing your research process? Are there any sources you recommend, such as a journalism textbook that clearly breaks down a methodology for fact-checking slash narrative building? If you were to take a broad and complicated subject, such as, was a certain terrorist event an inside job? I'm not going to read that out, by the way, but it's okay. I, I think people know what I'm referring to. Where would you begin and what would you do? Thank you for your content. I find your foreign query videos fascinating. Right, first of all, in the first thing we see, you stop reading news. I think that's a good thing, mate. The news is propaganda from top to bottom, full spectrum, and even some of the rare people who are trying to be earnest are used through the machinery and techniques of news to tell mistruths, lies, mischaracterize things, and malign people. That's just the nature of it, especially anything in the mainstream. The mainstream is an inverted domain. It is demonic as far as I'm concerned. There is not a love of truth or relationship with truth there. It's almost about how you can manage mistruth and dishonesty, and at best, maybe reach being disingenuous, which isn't really an ideal goal, is it, Tom? That should be the worst case scenario, not the best case scenario. So I would just say when you see just like being uninformed, it's like that classic quote, right? That someone who doesn't read the newspaper is uninformed, but someone who reads it is misinformed. So would you rather be misinformed than uninformed? I don't know that you would. So I think you've got the right sense, which is find a different route. Now, the key thing to say here is, this would be a great question to ask Richard Lewis, by the way, if you want specific textbooks, he probably can recommend you something. I can't because I didn't learn journalism formally. I didn't learn how to pick things apart formally. Some of it was being autistic and I'm going to learn how people work and social things, etc. A lot of my esports, I learned from people like Richard Lewis and observing them and asking them and listening to what they were talking about and what they recommended. So I'll just say my goal has been, uh, or my quest has been like 20 years long, hasn't it? I've interacted with many journalists over the years. I've seen the mistakes they have made. I've seen their success. I've seen what works, what doesn't. People like Richard Lewis have been massively influential. People like Christopher Hitchens have had an enormous impact on how I think about this particular field and truth and principles and what you should uphold, etc. If you look at my style, I would say I like to, first of all, so you can do this, I think, First things first, before I do anything, I want to just view the raw thing without anyone else's interpretation or addition. So I want to see the official story. I'd suggest you do this to ask, what is the actual thing that the consensus, the main body of people, a 
are being told to believe. Because the way that is framed will actually hint at a lot of things, sometimes by their absence, that you might need to look into. So what you do is look at the official story and ask yourself things like, are there any holes in their explanation? Are there any obvious lies or mistruths? Have they been overly generous with language and euphemism to seem a certain way, to downplay something, to blow something up? Are they distracting you from something with a certain angle they've taken? What is conspicuously not addressed in this press release or this statement or interview? Which key figures or names associated might have then had criminal problems or maybe even died after this particular thing happened? Then, a classic question, qui bono, who benefits? Who would actually benefit from this happening? Then, you can look at analysis from others or commentary from others or experts, etc. But even then, learn to pass it. Don't just be lulled in because you like them. Learn which areas don't make sense in what they're saying or what you'll need to investigate more or what doesn't quite fit or there's something where they're not quite saying something themselves or they're not addressing something. And again, you ask yourself, what aren't they saying? What won't they do? And then you go down that rabbit hole too. Think of it like a Poirot slash Sherlock Holmes mystery. By the way, try watching those and doing this and you'll actually actually train yourself. When you watch a Poirot slash Sherlock Holmes, here's the number one thing you need to know. If, if it's not impossible someone did the crime, you must always leave the possibility they did do the crime and spoil it in Poirot, they probably are the person who did the crime. That's just how it goes. So never eliminate anything from investigation or possibility until you know it is impossible. And when I say no, I mean really ironclad, especially if it's something you want to be true or you're someone you don't want to be in the wrong or don't want to be involved or blamed in some way, especially consider that they might be involved, might have done these things, it might be, otherwise you won't be able to honestly assess the situation. And then lastly, I would just say the biggest tool of all, the compass that will help you is intuition. I might do, if people ask enough, maybe I'll do a video, really like a full on one of that of things, techniques you can do, because I think working on your intuition is massive. My intuition for liars is insane. I've told the story before. Something like the second time I ever met Chris Badawi, I actually told Monte Cristo in private, I don't trust this person. I think they're a liar. They're dishonest. There's something wrong with the way they're going. And he would be like, what do you mean? Like, they're, they're a great guy. Wasn't he nice to you? Didn't he, have a he said he had a great time. I was like, oh, no, that's all the case. But something tells me, Monty, I've got this feeling about it. Something doesn't sit quite right. So I would just say, because I've built up this intuition, I was terrible at this when I was young, I can actually consciously pass things people are saying and get a sense for it. I get a sense if there's something dodgy, something feels off about them. Whenever something's conspicuous, I get an alarm bell that goes off. And then finally, I also have a really good vibe for what sort of archetypes all would fit in. And I've found when I can fit them into one, sometimes I can then act towards them the way I'd act to someone else in that archetype and they will respond accordingly. And this pattern makes sense. It's born out. It's efficacious. So I'd say there's a few little tips and pointers and sort of go down that direction or think about this. Wilson says, the Clint Mansell soundtrack for The Fountain has been in my music rotation for years since you recommended it on one of your AMAs on the main channel. Do you have any other recommendations for albums slash soundtracks that help you space out while long distance traveling, for example? Explosions in the Sky was similarly a banger recommendation. P.S. Thank you for all the fascinating interviews you've been doing recently on the side channel. Right, first of all, if you want things to space out to, an immediate name that comes to mind instantly is obviously Brian Nino. Some of the best ambient music of all time. Some of it with no beats. Just go check it out. There's loads of stuff there you can go with. If you like sort of one or two of the albums, you're going to like a lot of the other ones as well. I would say if you like mixes to space out to, well, what I often recommend is there's a guy on YouTube called Naked Flames who did these things called sleep mixes, which are for people who listen to the music without like crazy, like jarring cuts and big beats. No, it's more like the ambient stuff and the stuff that's in the background. And it's very well mixed together. And it's really quiet and brings the mood down. They are awesome for when you're traveling or just doing some work. So I like the ones by of, of the music of Boards of Canada or Aphex Twin or Orteca or even just the drone sounds. If you like um, the fountain and music soundtracks, like an obvious one to me, I've mentioned it many times, would be the Cinematic Orchestra where they actually used a real orchestra and made the soundtrack to the Disney, I think it was documentary called The Crimson Wing, Mystery of the Flamingos. It's sometimes written in French. Check that out. It's incredible. Some of the most stirring orchestral music you'll ever hear. They also did a soundtrack for an old school black and white film called Man with a Movie Camera. Fantastic new jazz, if you know that genre. Uh, Explosions in the Sky themselves, you might not be aware, have actually done some soundtracks of movies. Check those out if you just like their normal stuff. Um, the group Dredge, who I have, it was kind of like an art rock prog metal band. They've actually done a soundtrack called Waterborne. So if you like their material, check that out. 
I actually think the compilation soundtrack for the movie Pie by Darren Aronofsky is mega. It's all the best 90s electronica, basically, and breakbeat and big beat and stuff. Um, I've mentioned already recently on this channel the Queen of the Damned soundtrack, where it's acoustic stuff. But um, Well, here's the problem. I wouldn't get the soundtrack itself. It is good. It's got new metal singers doing the songs. I would get the Jonathan Davies Alone I Play acoustic live tour album, which has the better version of someone. But also the soundtrack for this is a banger. People like... The guy from Disturbed in Linkin Park and um, fucking whatever it's called. Ah, fucking hell. I don't remember. Not In Flames, like Static X. All these people are on this album, if you don't know. Um, the album soundtrack for Ashes of Time is mega. That's by someone called Frankie Chan and Roll A. Garcia. Just some fantastic music. A couple of tracks on that are incredibly emotional for me. People might know Hans Zimmer, the Gladiator soundtrack. You can't go wrong with that. It might be a famous one, but it's a banger. Aren't some of those like iconic tracks that you hear and you immediately get transported back? Yeah, there's a whole bunch for you. GDMN says, The discourse on Dune Messiah seems to suggest to me that people clearly don't understand the premise of the sequel, nor the key dilemma that Paul faces. I see countless people saying it's a terrible book as they've seen their hero turned into Space Hitler but never acknowledging that there has been an impossible battle raging inside Paul from the very moment he was sh shown inevitable, terrible purpose that he leads. I'm curious on your perception of Paul in this book and where you deem his morality to lie, and furthermore, your perception of said discourse on Dune Messiah. Right, first thing to say would be this. One thing you have nailed is that they don't look at the bigger picture. So the bit they mistake is this. From the end of Dune, you're going to think he's already become godlike. Like I once heard one of the shittest an uh, analogies for why they thought the Dune series sucked ever. They said all he does is just every book make it like a power creep and then people just go to another level, then another level, and then a mega quadruple quadruple. And it's like, that's not even vaguely what happens. What he actually does is expand out the universe in a way that's quite logical, proportional, and lets you tell interesting stories still. So the first thing I'd say is people do miss that the story of Leto the second is essential to understanding the story of Paul Atreides because Leto the second had access to prescience and the golden path in a way that Paul could only like briefly glimpse or couldn't control in the same way because he fucked himself up and became this insane spoiler insane spice infused hybrid human space worm who lived thousands of years so the point is that's what you had to do to in any sense really grasp all of the prescience of the golden path and to engage you and what did you know it was even essential to him that he essentially sort of blinded himself through his breeding programs and let them kill him so that he wouldn't be there anymore so he couldn't interfere that is incredibly telling to the story of the first one in the same way as in the original Star Wars trilogy the story of Luke is meant to parallel parallel but then contrast with the story of Anakin slash Vader isn't it it's a foreshadowing and a retelling of a story but in a way where like Jordan St. Peterson would say do you save your father from the underworld or whatever it's some of that isn't it so in the same way Leto redeems what went wrong with Paul's life right so the problem Paul had essentially was it was too much power he couldn't handle it it was frizzling frazzle in his brain and he definitely couldn't handle ultimate power so as you say the problem is he had all sorts of considerations and then also when you become the ultimate being you have ultimate power and you know more than everyone you can see the future and you've done things they haven't maybe you would think you have the right to decide everything maybe you think you're the only one capable of and because even you struggle it would be hard to know what morality is at that point in time you've become sort of godlike right and when you become godlike people only think of the positives don't gods decide who gets to live and die and what's right and what's wrong and can't gods excluded from certain laws and rules that apply to everyday mortals or men they do sort of, right? And Paul got lost in that and got stuck in that and got trapped by it and even trapped by the golden path. And that's why eventually he sort of becomes an iconoclast who speaks against all that stuff, doesn't he? As the preacher in the desert, as it were. So to me, that's the key thing that people misunderstand. Then on the whole angle of childish Redditors, like, he just turned into bloody Hitler and Hitler's the most evil thing ever, therefore it's all wrong. Like, you're just a child. You're incapable of actually understanding other perspectives, different contexts of history. I would just say, check out this Jordan Peterson video back before he was a nutter, where he did one that was a great one called something like You Would Have Been a Nazi or something insane like that. Obviously, he, he, he was very influenced by the work in the book Ordinary Men, the story about like a, a Polish police force that sort of eventually becomes more and more militaristic and eventually, well, you can see where it's leading if you think about that time in history. I think it's a fantastic sort of thing to consider because everyone does just go, I wouldn't, I'd have been that 
that one guy who did it do the salute. And then the joke is in esports, they all just turn around and sell their ass to fucking Saudi Arabia or China when they don't even eat to just to talk about video games. But I'm supposed to believe push comes to shove, they'd be a hero and risk being killed. Would they fuck? Then I'd also say, just like Paul had to learn, a part of the problem here as well is you might have power and prescience, but maybe it's not appropriate for you to always exert that power and use that prescience. Maybe sometimes it's important that you don't. And then lastly, I'll just say this. I think one thing it does brilliant in the first arc, the Paul arc, is point out what utopian fantasies actually lead to. Here's the problem. Life in itself, individually, I think is defined by hard principles. But society, on some level, can have some hard principles if we're all homogenous, but needs a little bit of compromise to lubricate the system and make it work right. So we don't have to have endless religious wars, political wars, racial wars. So the problem is, and this is the reason why I will always go so fucking hard against ideas like communism, is the problem that utopian fantasies they are utopian. Utopia means no place. They can't ever exist. They never will. They're a dream in your mind. So the question is, how many real life people's lives would you ruin or end to fulfill a dream in your mind that you wish was true, but can never be true? See, there's the part. That's like, notice I've almost asked you, are you a serial killer or a sociopath when I said that? This is why a lot of left-wing people are intensely fucked up in the sense that if you look at them, they hate people individually, like their own family, their own friends, their own culture and society, but then they love just the unwashed mass that they don't have to interact with. They never can know about. They can just make like a Disney poor animal that needs to be protected and saved and they never have to actually ask themselves hard questions or what would that person think? Because the joke is half the people they speak for, they would also then have cancelled if that person spoke English and had Twitter and said what they actually believed or thought. So I would also say the main problem, the scariest mechanism in the history of humanity goes like this. It is that when you have a utopian fantasy, but you believe it's possible, the notion becomes that it's going to be a perfect world that will fix all wrongs, all problems, and make potentially like Dune, thousands of years of incredible peace and stability and harm reduction. And the problem with that is, if it really is it, it, the best possible scenario with the best possible outcomes for the longest possible time, their logic goes, you do this cynical fucking equation, which I never would do because I treat people individually, but you do this equation of human life and you go, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. And it actually justifies any amount of death, any amount of death, if you believe that. That is why those people in regimes always kill each other. They always sometimes essentially like commit a form of political suicide. They kill their countries. They kill off massive amounts of people because that is always, oh, well, we haven't got the fantasy yet. Better kill another person. Oh, well, these people are in our way. Better kill them. Oh, this person doesn't quite agree exactly with how I do it. Better get rid of them. And eventually, there's no one left. And the joke is, yeah, eventually, in like communism, if you go to the end result, it does work because eventually no one has any food and everyone dies. That's the joke, right? But that's also why I think it's a terrible, horrific worldview, right? Panda. The recommendation from my last question was much appreciated. So with a willingly masochistic spirit, sir, please, sir, I want some more. In some of your early content on this channel, you discussed Robert Anton Wilson, Illuminatus, Cosmic Trigger, and some related tangents. I also discussed that earlier in this AMA, but you couldn't have known that. In recent times, the term PSYOP, or psychological operation, has reached the mainstream of some circles. I'm just curious if you ever experimented with the more universally applicable FNOD from the aforementioned books, and if you had any thoughts on it. I myself find it a better tool for avoiding any grand proclamations of cosmic schmuckery. Now, the irony of that, of course, being that Robert Anton Wilson's books are filled with cosmic schmuckery, but at least he had the sense of humour that he sort of sometimes wouldn't take himself seriously, so he can forgive it in some ways. That's why it's a good approach, right? The problem is this. I'm not just going full Alan Moore, but certainly go and read interviews and listen to interviews with Alan Moore, and you'll get a sense of what I mean by this. Words are spells. They're mouth utterances that travel through the air or you read scribblings on a piece of paper. In your brain, that doesn't even come in just as a word. It comes in as an idea, as an associated set of things, as some archetypes, as a representation of a person, a thing that happened in time, a place. And suddenly there's images in your mind. There's a place. You're going back to memories. You're imagining things that haven't yet been. You're imagining places you haven't seen. You're imagining things that you've only heard of but never experienced. The, the effect on your consciousness is magic. That is magic. So as a result, of course, every day, everyone is loading up words as spells to have an effect on the world and other people. The world of politics is just all this. It's all perception. 
And I'd also say it's why all news has filled with euphemisms. If you say, we, our side, killed a load of people, some of them were innocent without weapons today, isn't that bad? Oh, wait, but we were doing it for the right reasons, so it's okay. Instead, you go, uh, you know, troubles as there were more... Um, Civilian casualties than expected during the push into Fallujah as the Allied forces made their best to break. Other. Yeah, exactly. You just do that. And you, even though you're still communicating the same info, it doesn't hit the same way. It doesn't have the same things loaded into it. You've, in fact, preloaded with different notions that then have the effect on someone. Now, in terms of why I don't use Fnord, is because only one, because you've read out Robert Anna Wilson books, are going to know what it means. So it's actually less applicable than PSYOP. If you even heard the term psychological operation, you get it already. Someone's running an operation on your psychological processes or your psyche that they're trying to interfere with or influence for an odd is like too complicated most people even now don't even know what you talk about even if they read those books so i would just say like it's not a terrible term i just don't think it's that useful and in terms of like uh what i think of it i also do think that that even is a component of things like yeah i'll give you an angle here's an angle people won't know i actually think part of the secret of this type of language and things like gematria and chords is it isn't for you and me i think some of it is to as a way that the the bigger systems can get information out to their operatives just through a newspaper. Famously, supposedly that was what things like double agents and in the Cold War were sometimes getting their info from a headline or a line in a newspaper or read this certain page. I think some of that's going on there. I do think some of those words are intended to have an effect, but I also think every news story is supposed to hit you in a certain way. The racial thing, the angle of culture, the things that you've know, the partisan issues. I think it's all supposed to do that. So yeah, I think this is actually quite a key concept. The real fluid, this is the last one, Previously, you have mentioned watching and enjoying the 1988 anime series, Legend of the Galactic Heroes. How do you see it feel about the series' portrayal of masculinity and history? And how does the series hold up to other modern media? Right, I haven't watched the reboot slash remake. I've only watched the original. It is the best anime by far. It's actually one of the best TV shows ever made. Forget anime. But it's not non-stop action. Hence why I can see why people who just want the fucking, like shown in anime aren't going to be able to vibe with it. It's going to be too slow for them. This is a show for people who like The Wire, Game of Thrones, House of Cards. If you love these things, surely you're going to fucking love this show if you just give it 10 episodes. By the way, it's good from episode one. There aren't filler ones. They're all interesting characterizations of people, even when they're not about the main storyline. It's not like other anime where it's a cynical filler because they wait for the manga to catch up. I love the use on this masculinity and history angle. I love the use of heroic archetypes in this. It's a great portrayal of different types of soldiers, all different types that you encounter. It shows a lot of nuanced, dynamic relationships that occur in society, in government, in the army, between people, between warring forces, between people who are against each other in some areas but have certain principles that they share, between people who just hate each other, between people who secretly work with each other like that certain planet, of, I won't say which one yet, that sort of tries to go between and just like little shady stuff with their own fucking naughty little schemes there's actually so much nuance and shades in this show then i'd also say i actually love the fact that it sort of forces a notion that i think is key to masculinity which is agency like if you don't have a plan or you're not trying to have a plan or an actor plan you're gonna end up being part of someone else's plan whether you know it or not and then i just think in general the historical telling it's very clear to me that this person who wrote these scripts had some sort of a shrewd nuanced understanding of things like the life of Napoleon or Alexander the Great or maybe Genghis Khan, these sorts of, I think they had a sense for this. In fact, by the way, if you like things like the Dune Saga, I think you're going to fuck with this show as well. It's got certain elements about that that you're going to be able to vibe with massively. Okay, that's it for this one. The sooner people submit a bunch of good questions, the sooner I'll do the next one. As usual, check out Gamer Sops. Obviously, if people don't know, a tweak I'm going to make is it turns out you can pin threads on Patreon. So I'll make sure the AMA collection thread is always the top pinned one. And I'll do these more often if people ask the questions more often. Obviously, my main gig is over in esports on my main channel, but my side channel and all my content around my other interests here are kindly supported by my Patreon community on Thorin's side here. So do you want to ask me a question for my video AMA? Do you want to take part in a private one-on-one -on -one exclusive, never to be released, but recorded for you session? Call it consulting. Call it just a conversation if you want. Do you want to find out who upcoming guests are for the Thor Inquiry episodes? If any or other other perks like this take your interest check out the patreon link in the description box below and join Thorin's side today